Bobby Joe said he'd rather be in here than any jail. Well, the second place I ever preached was Knox County Jail and had a very captive audience. So we'll see how you guys measure up today. But uh, <clears throat> you'll be taking God's Word, <clears throat> be finding 1 Kings chapter 18, 1 Kings chapter 18 this morning. And I want to encourage you uh, when you leave today, I want to give you some homework to read the whole passage. A lot of times I camp out on the whole passage. Uh, just going to take some segments this morning, but take the time after the day's service and read because uh, this story, if you've gone to church your whole life, should be uh, very familiar to you. The most famous ones is you got Elijah and the confrontation between him and the prophets of Baal with the, the awesomeness of God on display. So if, if you've not already, find me in 1 Kings 18, excuse me, chapter 18, verse 21. And it says, And Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people did not answer him a word. We jump to verse 38. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, And the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. <clears throat> Where I just came from, it was an older church, and behind this church, around this church, was a cemetery, a very old cemetery. The church had been founded, uh, the charter was in 1781. They'd moved to this building in, in the early 1800s. And <clears throat> it was old. It was so old, or is so old, that there's a Revolutionary War veteran buried there. And there's some a War of 1812 vets buried there. And, and there's this tombstone from this vet from the War of 1812 and another person's tombstone. And they're starting to be pushed apart there in, in the cemetery. Because you see, in between these, two, these tombstones was an oak tree. And as the tree got taller and taller, it got bigger and bigger, and it began to tombstones as it grew. And we know the origin behind this. At some point, that oak tree was an acorn, a tiny acorn, something you had to avoid falling and tripping on on the, on the sidewalk. So over the years, over the decades, this acorn, it sprouted, and now it's this towering oak tree, and it has changed the things around it. It's no longer the same. And when I think about that oak tree and the origin of that oak tree, I think about my own life. There have been times where I have felt like an acorn, small, insignificant, Overwhelmed by my situation and, and circumstances, patterns of behavior that were in my own life, and, and just things I, I struggle with, to be honest with you. And, and I wondered if I was ever going to see change in my life. Am I ever going to grow, to mature, to be a better person? It reminds me of Isaiah 61, verse 3 where he calls us oaks of righteousness. Oaks of righteousness. And I love that image because when we got saved, God put the acorn of the gospel into our hearts, into our lives. And the Bible says that once we got saved, well, we were justified. It's this one time, one deal act. So when you surrender your life to Christ, the Bible says that you were justified, which simply means that you were declared righteous. But I'll be honest. When I think about myself and my life, I don't feel so righteous 
especially when I became a Christian, I felt wretched. How could God declare me righteous? Well, it was because God didn't look at me. He did not look at you, Christian, through the lens of your own decision-making. He looks at us through the lens of Jesus Christ. And when you got saved, God did a cash app where he took the righteousness of Jesus and then he wired it on your account. And now he can authentically look at you, look at me, Christian, and declare you to be righteous. Not because of what you have done, but because of what God has done and what he accomplished for you on the cross. Is there anybody here right now that is grateful to God that you are not the sum total of your decisions that you have made? But, but you are who you are because you have been made justified through the power of Jesus Christ. So now he's declared you to be righteous. He, he, and now he's taking you on, I've, I've talked about this before, this process called sanctification. And sanctification means that God is making you to be what he has already declared you to be, and that is righteous. So he is taking you from an acorn to an oak tree. So you're in this process of change, Christian. And that's why you should be able, any one of us that call ourselves a Christian, and look through the rearview mirror of our life and say two things. One, I've not already arrived. You're leaving, someone cuts me off on, on I-75, you may be tempted to talk to that person in sign language. And not the good kind, because we're a work in progress. But secondly, while I have not arrived, I should be able to declare that I am not where I once was. He is changing me for his honor and for his glory. So anyone grateful today, you're not who you used to be. Everyone's spouses said yes, you know. And so God is changing you. We're on this journey of change as we sing, He's still working on me. And so He's changing. And I want to speak this to you. It may sound a little odd, but be patient with yourself. Be patient with yourself. I didn't say be passive, but patient. God knew all your failures, all your struggles, if you're like me, all your stupidity, and he knew all your bad habits, and he still saved you. Despite of who we are, he still said, I want you. I want to spend eternity with you. I love you. I sent my son to die for you. So when we look at this text today, if I could use one word to, to encompass What's going on here is the word change. Change. He wants the nation of Israel in this passage to change. And you need to understand what got them to where they are in this passage. In 1 Kings 11, they do something awful. Under the leadership of Solomon, Solomon introduces the worship of Baal. And this is the the false god to the nation of Israel. And when we come to our text, Solomon, he is no longer king. Now Ahab is king. And he's called an evil king, and he's married to an evil queen, and her name is Jezebel. And they take the worship of Baal that was introduced during the reign of Solomon, and Ahab and Jezebel now make the worship of Baal the state religion. And this is it's devastating. It's devastating. And, and you need to know what Baal was known as. One thing Baal was known as is that he was known as the storm god, which means that he's known as the god who sends down the rain. Well, this is important because Israel is an agrarian society. It's an agricultural uh, community. Uh, that means that they are dependent on the rain to, to grow the crops. But instead of looking to God, the true source 
of rain to bring the rain, they now divert their attention from the true God to the false God of Baal and begin to lean on him to provide for the rain. Well, this is very important because in 1 Kings 17, God says, okay, <clears throat> all right. If you want to look towards false gods and worship the idols of this world to provide you with rain, Elijah, you tell the people they ain't getting no rain. For three years, it's not going to be, or three and a half years, it's not going to be any rain. <clears throat> so let me just stop right here, come, into your, come to your house, knock on your, knock on your door, sit in your living room, put my feet on your coffee table, and I just want to tell you to be very careful about the idols in your life. God has this uncanny ability of messing with things in our life that we are leaning on for our meaning, value, purpose, and significance. God has a way of knocking things off on your life that you are leaning on as a way to get your attention. There are times when we turn to God because the foundations of our life are shaking only to realize that he is the one who is doing the shaking. Do you want to know what one of the idols is in my life? I'm a very performance-driven, success-driven person. It's not just, you know, I want to be successful. That's in and of itself okay. But I could craft an identity for my success. And do you know how God dealt with me with my success idol? He blessed me by having me work with kids who could care less. Uh, I'm like, really, you're not going to turn in any homework? Uh, you, you're not going to the study? You're not going to, to do anything? You, you don't care if you've got to repeat this grade? You, you don't, it doesn't matter to you? You know how frustrating that is? Maybe some of your parents know. Uh, not, to, not to care. And listen, I, I still... I held these students to 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 a standard. But in the midst of all that, God asked me something. He says, Victor, will you still love that student? Even when that student doesn't perform, just as I love you when you don't meet my standard. So some of us were looking at our job, and our job instead of a resource has become the source of who we are. And so God says, all right, if you want to worship your job, okay, we're going to downsize the company. You're going to get a pink slip, and now you'll be scrambling to find a job, and you're going to realize that a job is the resource, and I'm a source. Okay, single person, this new person in your life has taken my place. And I'm just going to have to break that relationship up. Or, okay, you're in, a, you're in a season of prosperity. In the season of prosperity, you're not talking to me. You're not in your word. You're not attending church. You're not evangelizing. So let me just send this health crisis your way to rattle your cage a little bit until your priorities are in order. So I just want to tell you, be very careful of the idols in your life because God has the uncanny uh, habit of coming after our own bells. So God says, okay, Israel, you actually believe that Baal is going to send the rain. You want to, to, to worship Baal. So he tells Elijah that I want you to go and get all the prophets of Baal. <laughs> that's, that's 850 of them. And he takes them up to, to Mount Carmel and, and, and call now my people, the nation of Israel. And I'm going to show them my awesome glory and power. And then you go to verse 21. And Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. 
And the people did not answer him a word. So the text, again, is about change. And change. Israel, you are limping between two opinions. And the idea of the phrase, go limping, in the original Hebrew means to be on the fence. And to be on the fence. It means that you have one foot in the church, but you have another foot in the world. It means that you have enough Jesus to be acceptable, but not so much Jesus that you'll be seen as fanatical. It's the idea of cultural Christianity where I'm not radical, but I'm acceptable. I'm okay. I can lift up my holy hands in church on Sunday, but don't ask me where those same hands were last night. It, it means that I can use my voice to praise God, but with that same voice, I'm going to cuss along with my favorite musician when I get in my car and leave church. It's the idea of being on the fence. You ever been there? You ever been on on the fence in some season of, of life? <clears throat> I know I have. Excuse me for a moment. I know the church of Laodicea had. And that's why Jesus said, I wish you were <clears throat> hot or cold, <clears throat> but because you are lukewarm, I will spit you out of my mouth. Apostle Paul, <clears throat> who wrote most of the New Testament, <clears throat> he knew what it meant <clears throat> to go limping. In Romans 7, it says, you know, I find myself frustrated because I find myself at, at times I'm doing the very things that I don't want to do, which is to sin. In verse 24, Paul says, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Do you know what, excuse me for a moment. Do you know what body of death means? What that's referring to? In the Roman world, <clears throat> during Paul's day, <clears throat> there were times if someone was convicted of murder, <clears throat> one of the possible punishments that the Romans had was they'd take that corpse of that person that you killed and they would strap it to you. This dead, decaying, stinking corpse that you killed would be on your back. And they would chain it to you, and they would call it the body of death. And so you would go to Kroger, and there you would have the body of death chained to you. You would go to work, and you would have the body of death chained to you. You would go to sleep at night, and that body of death would be on top of you as you tried to, to sleep. And Paul is saying our bad habits are like a body of death. And he says, I want to be delivered. I want to be set free. And maybe some of us came in here this morning to the house of the Lord with the body of death on our back. The body of death may be an addiction. Maybe you struggle with being an alcoholic. Maybe the body of death may be a, a drug addiction. Maybe the body of death may be a, a porn addiction. Uh, your body of death may be from, from debt, from, from bad stewardship. Are you just uh, not a good steward of what God has blessed you with? And Elijah says, how long will you be on the fence? And the people answered, not a word. Because you see, their silence says a lot. <clears throat> Once, to me, one way that you know that you are saved is that you don't enjoy sin. You have the Holy Spirit in you that will convict you of your sin. <clears throat> so I just want to tell you this morning, be very scared of someone who says they are saved but they can still enjoy sin. 
We all sin. Don't get me wrong. We all do. But if you enjoy it, <laughs> have you ever made up your mind to sin and you couldn't even enjoy it? You're all acting like I'm the only one up here that, that, that applies to. <clears throat> but, but, but there's this tension. So let's not be so hard on Israel. The tension communicates conviction. I'm going back and forth, back and forth, and, and that's good. But Elijah now says, okay, Israel, it's time to get off the fence. It's time to change. Do you want to change? And all they say is, So here's the question. Have you ever looked at the bad patterns, the bad habits in your life, and something says in you, yeah, I like to change, but I'm kind of okay with it. Yeah, I know I shouldn't be talking to her. Yeah, I, I, I know... I'm married, but I'm kind of okay with it. Yeah, I know I've got this drinking problem, but I'm kind of okay with it. Yeah, I know I got all kinds of debt. I'm buying things I shouldn't. There's things I have that I should sell. There's cards I should cut up. But I'm kind of okay with it. Can we be honest in the house of the Lord this morning? You can never change if you have a I'm okay with it spirit. And the first step to change is to go from I'm okay with it to I'm sick of it. I'm sick of it. You will never change until you're sick of it. <clears throat> so here's the principle, change only happens when the pain to stay the same is greater than the pain to change. That's why some of you don't go to the dentist. Some of y'all's dentist is, I'll go to you when I need to. <laughs> but nothing will get us faster than a toothache. So <clears throat> you, you, you and I, we may talk about, you know, someone may come up to me, hey, Victor, or hey, Bobby Joe, will you talk to someone about their sin? Okay, maybe, but my biggest question is, do they really want change? You can't help nobody until they're sick of their behavior. So how do I change? You have to ask the question, am I sick of it? <laughs> so for some of you here today, your prayer may be, Lord, Make me sick of it because you will never change until you get there. And once we're there, how do you change? Well, here in 1 Kings 18, the people of God, they're on the fence. God says it's time to change. He calls them to Mount Carmel and bring the, the 850 prophets of, of Baal. And Elijah, you're going to be the, the only prophet of God. You're going to be outnumbered 850 to 1. And I want you to set up this altar. And what's interesting to me is God has an agenda. He wants the people to change. But notice how he does it. He doesn't get them a book to read on change. He doesn't have them read the Bible, as important that is. He, he doesn't have them listen to a sermon series on, on change, as important as, as that can be. And I just want to say, if all this sermon is to you this morning it is, is for you to hear a message on change and to take some notes, and that's it, you're never going to change. You're never going to change. What God does in 1 first, first Kings 18 is he unveils himself in one of the most visually most stunning miracles we see in Scripture. He breathes fire down from heaven. 
It, it laps up the water, the, the altar, the wood, the, the offering. And when the people see the glory and the awesomeness of God, when they see that, when they encounter that, when they experience God and who he is, now, now that sets the table for change. So here's the principle. Change doesn't begin with our hands or with our feet, but change actually begins with our eyes. Dr. Ann Thorndike, who's a physician at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, she was frustrated one day because she was looking at the food choices in the hospital cafeteria, and she thought, man, we have some unhealthy choices here for the hospital. So she didn't, uh, excuse me, she got permission. She didn't make a big deal out of this. She didn't announce it. But, but you know, she's frustrated. And, and this is what she did. Because when you checked out, right next to you, there was nothing but sodas. Well, she didn't remove the soda. She kept the sodas there, but she put up some bottled water. And, and, and you know, over time, you know, people bought the, the, the sales of sodas went down, and the, the, the sales of water were solid. And also, there were some, some snacks there. Well, she, you know, there was nothing healthy, so she put something there, and the same thing, the junk food pro, uh, consumption went down, and, and the, the other stuff was purchased. And here's what she understood, and it's a marketing principle. It's not necessarily what you offer, but sometimes it's, where you offer. So the principle is whatever has your attention will get your actions. Whatever has your attention will get your actions. So change begins with taking inventory of your life. <clears throat> you know, growing up, I could eat as much as I want whenever I want and not gain a pound. Times change. And one of the culprits, man, it's some of these doggone Christian conferences I go to. I, I go to them, you know, before you go to a hotel room, they, they got these snack bags filled with good but, but godless stuff. It's, it's cookies and candy. And, Chad, I don't want to waste the Lord's money. So, you know, I'll be a good steward. I, I've got to, I got to consume this stuff, and I end up eating it. And why is that? Because whatever has your attention will have your actions. Some of you, not today, today is the Lord's Day, later in this week, you'll go to the grocery store, and you've gone there with nothing but healthy stuff on your list. And you're doing well, and you get to the checkout line, and is it just me or is that checkout line demonic? You know, because there aren't bananas or, or apples or anything healthy like that, all of a sudden, you're just there doing the Lord's work, and that bag of M&Ms have just went ahead and then jumped off into your cart. And again, why is that? Because whatever has your attention has your actions. So when we talk about change, the question is, does God have your attention? Often we talk about change, and when we do, we focus on the negative. I can't look at, I can't, I can't go to, uh, I can't do that. But when you're focusing on it, you're more likely going to stumble. Just like I said, hey, don't think about zebras. What do you just think about? Zebras, right? So <clears throat> that's why, I, you know, it's important that I, you know, I set aside time in my day where, God, you have my attention. On the commute, I'm listening to a praise song, to a, a podcast, or a sermon. And why is that? Because, God, you have my attention. And when he has my attention, he's going to get my actions. So it's impossible to be filled with the Spirit and be engaging in sin at the same time. Second, change may start with my eyes, but it involves my hands. I notice God doesn't just send down the fire. He says, Elijah, you actually have a role to play. Then you look at verse 31. Elijah took 12 stones, according to the number of the tribes of the son of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be your name. And with the stones, he built, he built, he built an altar in the name of the Lord. 
So when we talk about miracles in the Bible, quite often we're talking about change. And what's interesting is that in the Bible, for the most part, when God performs a miracle, he does so in partnership and in concert with people. Elijah, build the altar. I'm not just going to do it. You're going to have a robe. And one chapter earlier with the widow, she's about to starve. What happens? Well, give me your last little bit. I'm not just going to give you the food, but give me that little bit that you have. The feeding of the 5,000. Jesus just doesn't feed them. Jesus says to the little boy, hey, just give me that few, you know, loaves and, and fish. You know, with change, there's two extremes. On one extreme, some of you are like, man, I, God, I'm just waiting on you to change. I'm just waiting on God. And God's waiting on you to do something. He's waiting on you. See, that's change is a partnership. That's why it says in Philippians 2, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That's our part. But here's God's part. For it is God who is at work in you, both the will and the work for his good pleasure. In other words, change is not just something that happens to us, but it's something that you and I participate in. And in Scripture, we often see that God begins with the little that we have. The widow, you give the little that you have left. Boy, with the two loaves, just give me the little you have left. And some of you, you have goals in life, spiritual goals, and I applaud you for that. You may say, I'm going to pray in an hour uh, every, every, each and every single day. And you haven't even prayed five minutes a day. Start out with a little before you get to a lot. I don't want to kill your dreams, and if the Holy Spirit's telling you to do something, well, be obedient and do it for sure. But you need to understand that it is okay to bring God a little, and he can grow it from there. He can take that mustard seed of your faith, that acorn, and turn it into an oak. So Elijah does this in verse 36. And at the time of the offerings of the <coughs> oblation, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel. I think for a lot of us, we're what I want to call two-column prayers. Uh, <coughs> two columns. You know, number one, we make the request. Here my body. Uh, God, save that loved one that I have. God, uh, give me that job, that promotion. Column number two. Well, I'll wait on the response and the answer. Two columns, but here Elijah brings in a third column. He said, God, I'm praying for change. But I want it done so it is known that you are God. In other words, third column, God, this change is not about change for the sake of change. It is about change for your glory. So Hannah, talk about her on Mother's Day. She was a third column prayer. God, I want a child, but if you bless me with this child, I'm going to give him back to you for your glory. So here's the revelation. <clears throat> Some of us have not experienced change, not because God does not want to give it to you, but because your posture is wrong. God understands that for some of us, if he gives us a change, it will become a platform for arrogance. where we will boast in ourselves. <clears throat> but when he adds, or when we add the third column, this is for your glory, then he knows that we can handle and steward that, that, that. And he will bring about that change because we realize it's not about me and my before and after shots that I put on social media, but it is about the glory of God. So God, yes, I pray for that promotion so I can give more money to your kingdom. God, bless me for a bigger house so I can do 
greater acts of hospitality for your glory. God, heal my body so I may live longer, so I may testify to the goodness of your glory. And and notice, he praises in faith. Elijah, what he's asking for is for God to send the rain. And what he is asking for is, is so big that the only way that it can happen is if God does it. God has to do it. And so often the change that you're believing in can only be done, if it's only done by, by you, your vision's too small. But we must lean on him. We must learn to avoid what I call yeah, right prayers. Yeah, right prayers. Have you ever prayed something so big that while you prayed it, you said to yourself, yeah, right. That's not going to happen statistically. That's very unlikely. But that's why James tells us that when we pray, we must not be like the double-minded man who is unstable in all of his ways. We must pray in faith. And later in James 5, 17, it says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. So things changed. And why? Because he prayed, and he didn't just pray, but he prayed in faith. <clears throat> Go home on this. A story is told of a small southern town that was going through a horrific drought. It had been going on for a few years, and it was devastating. They lived in an agrarian uh, society, just like the Israelites did, and they lived off the fruit of the land. And, and the drought <laughs> kept on. It kept lingering on, and farms were foreclosing people and friends and family. They were uh, beginning to to depart, to to move out of the town. And finally, one Sunday, at the end of his sermon, the pastor said, listen, y'all, we've been going through this drought, and it's been wearing us out. Y'all got friends and loved ones that moved. I think it's time we just got together and prayed. We're going to beseech the God in heaven tonight at 6 that he would send rain down on the community. I ain't going to preach on prayer. I'm not going to talk about prayer. I ain't going to testify about rain. We're just going to get together, and we're just going to pray. (laughs) Well, that evening is a typical southern evening. It was about 90 degrees, 90% humidity. There was not a cloud in the sky. Deacon Jones, he was standing on the steps of the old church greeting people. (laughs) But all of a sudden... (laughs) Out of the corner of Deacon Jones' eyes, there was this peculiar sight. It was the oldest member of the church. It was Mother Mary. She was walking down that old, dusty road. (coughs) And when you looked at Mother Mary, Mother Mary had a rain jacket on. Mother Mary had on a, a, a rain hat. Mother Mary had on some, some rain shoes. And Mother Mary had an umbrella wide open as an umbrella could be. Well, she came to the foot of the steps, and Deacon Jones goes down to, to, to help him up, help her up, show some southern hospitality. And, and Deacon Jones, he could not contain himself. He said, Mother Mary, I just want to know, I don't mean no disrespect, but it's It's 90 degrees, it's 90% humidity without a cloud in sight, and I'm looking at you with this rain jacket on, this rain hat on, this rain shoes on, and an umbrella wide open as an umbrella can be. Mother Mary, why are you dressed this way? Mother Mary looked at Deacon Jones like he was crazy. (laughs) She said, Deacon Jones, My pastor said that we are going to call on the God on heaven, not our next-door neighbor. We're going to call on God, not not any human being. We're going to call on God to bring the rain, and if I'm going to pray for rain, I might as well come dressed for the rain. (laughs) Well, Mother Mary, 
gets inside, and they begin to pray like they have never prayed before, that God would open up the windows of heaven and would just send down the rain. And about 45 minutes into this meeting, they started to hear the pitter-patter on the roof until it sounded like cats and dogs coming down on the roof and on the pavement. And they could not control themselves anymore. They stopped praying. They, they rushed to the windows. They, they looked outside, and there it was. It was rain. And they were high-fiving. They were running around the church, the building. The, the Hammond B3 organ started to play, and they were just elated. And just like that, there was solace. See, <clears throat> this was a small southern town. Everybody had just walked to church. But the only person who was prepared to walk home in the rain was Mother Mary. Friends, you need to understand that when you come to God and you start asking him to change patterns, to change things, you ain't talking to your next-door neighbor. You ain't even talking to your pastor. You're not talking to some dignitary. You are talking to the God who said, let there be light, and there was light. You are talking to the God who opened the Red Sea, who was there with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace, who was the God who closed the, uh, had the angels close the mouth of lions that were around Daniel. You are talking to the God who raised the dead Jesus. So, friend, when you pray, you better put on your rain jacket, your rain hat, your rain boots, you have your umbrella open, and you pray in faith. So, listen, God is good no matter what he does in life, whatever what happens. So that's the call. God, whatever happens, I pray for your glory, but whatever happens, we're good either way. We're fine. But some of y'all, sometimes our faith is too small. So what are you believing in God today? What is God telling you that you need to put your rain jacket on. If you're here today and you're trusting God for a huge change, I mean a big change, a change of some pattern, a change of some habit, whatever it is, or maybe it has nothing to do if you're dis- with a decision, maybe it's a, a health diagnosis, maybe it's prodigal living of a, of a child, but whatever the change is, God, you're going to have to do it. If that's you, if you're comfortable, I want to ask you to stand and pray. Or stand up, we're going to have a prayer. If, if, you, if you don't feel comfortable, that's fine. I know it's a little different, a little hokey. Maybe there's something in your life that you've been asking for change. And we're going to pray. And for some of us, our first prayer is going to be, God, make me sick of it. God, <clears throat> help me to change. Whatever it is, feel free to stamp those that pray or, or standing next to them. Let's pray. Our Father and God, there's... We're all different that come in here, Lord. Some of us, we have a habit, a pattern, an addiction, Lord, that we're ashamed of. We, don't, we, would, we would be scared to death if someone knew. But God, our first prayer is, Lord, change us, Lord. Help us to not be okay with it, that we're sick of it, Lord, that we want to change. We want to become more like your son, that people would see him in us, not just when we're around other people, but also when we're alone. Lord, maybe it's a, a change for a health diagnosis. Lord, I've been praying. I've been going to the hospital. They can't figure out what's wrong or, or my health continues to decline, Lord, or maybe it's a loved one's health, Lord. God, God, help me. Maybe it's grief, Lord. I don't know how I can keep going on in this world. I miss my loved one who's gone. Help me, Lord. Maybe it's spending habits, but whatever God is calling you to do, Maybe you're here and you've never said, Lord, I, <laughs> I want the biggest change. I want your righteousness. So, Lord, today I want to dedicate my life to you. I want to follow you. Maybe it's to join this church. But whatever God is calling you to do, I want to urge you to do it. Know that you're not alone. There's other people here that love you, that will lock arms with you, that will be there for you, that will build you up. So, God, whatever 
is going on in our lives. God, we just ask the Spirit would move in this place that whatever change needs to happen will be done. And whatever happens, Lord, we'd seek to give you the glory. So in we pray, amen. And at this time, continue standing if you're standing. Uh, we're going to sing. And if God's calling you to make a decision, I'll be up front, be praying for those around you. But don't leave this place without being obedient to God. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided. to Christ, whatever it is today, heed his call. Maybe you need to pray for yourself. Lord, there's something going on in my life. I just need help. Maybe you, you're, you're at a place and you don't know how to handle things that, that you're in a good place. There's people that love you, will be there for you. Whatever God is calling you to do, don't wait. should be seated at this time. Uh, move the podium and whatnot out of the way. We're going to have two baptisms. Again, baptism, it's, <clears throat> baptism doesn't save you. It's like a wedding ring. You know, this wedding ring says I'm married. It's symbolic of my relationship with my wife. Uh, if I take it off, I'm still married. If you're not married and you put it on, it doesn't make you married. But it's, it's symbolic of the commitment.